Hello statistics students, it is time for section 6.3, the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem is one of those really big ideas that it's sometimes a little tricky to wrap your brain around, so stick with me on this. It's not as intimidating as it looks. Once we get the formulas down and what the questions look like, you'll be okay. So don't get overwhelmed by all of this. So I started off this section with an example. So let's say we're doing medical testing of triglyceride levels. So we select a sample of 30 males. We find the average, the mean of their triglyceride levels, and we get that first sample is 187 milligrams per deciliter. And then we select a second sample of 30, right? And then we find another mean. So we find we it's with replacement. We stick those 30 back in, and then we just pick another 30 men. We find the triglyceride levels. These ones are at 192 milligrams per deciliter. And then we find a third sample, a fourth sample, a fifth sample. We find 100 samples, maybe, of samples. So we're going to continue selecting until we have 100 samples, and therefore we've calculated 100 sample means, 100 x-bars. So those x-bars are our new data. We're going to ignore all the initial raw data we've got. So we're going to let the sample means take the average of all those, and that's going to be our random variables. So our sample means become a sampling distribution of sample means. We're taking the means of the means is what we're doing. Okay, I, like I said, be, be patient with me. Central limit theorem is a big idea, but you'll get the hang of it. Because remember, sometimes a sample isn't representative enough. So we're going to take samples and we're going to find it all the means of our samples. So the de definition then of a sampling distribution of a sample or sample means is a distribution using the means computed from all possible random samples. We took 100 samples in that triglyceride example and we found the means of all of those sample means. The sample means will be somewhat different from the population mean, right? Because and not everything's a perfect sample. We might know our whole population mean, but every sample might be slightly different. That's okay. That's caused by sampling error. Each one will be slightly different. Just like the initial example, what did we have? A 192 and then a 187? They're slightly different. It's sampling error. That's all right. We would love to believe we have the most perfect sample ever, but sometimes we just don't. That's why we have all these safeguards built into statistics. All right, so let's talk about sampling error for a quick minute. So sampling error is the difference between the sample measure and the population member measure. So in other words, my sample means that I got from my 30 people is different from my population mean that I got from every single adult male out there. Sampling error, we have to remember the sample is not a perfect representation of the population. We talk about this incessantly, right? So the difference between our sample measure and our population measure, because it's not always perfect. So let's talk about some properties of the distribution of the sample means. So distribution of the sample means remembers when we're taking the averages of all those sample averages. So the first property, the mean of the sample means, x bar, will be the same as the population mean mu. If we prefer to write that a little bit easier, we could just say x bar equals mu, right? It will end up being closer and closer the more sample means you find. And then average those all out. Second property is the standard deviation of the sample means will be smaller than the standard deviation of the population. So in other words, remember standard deviation of sample is S will be less than sigma, our population standard deviation. Therefore, we're going to have a slightly different formula when we're talking about st uh, standard deviations if we're looking at a sample or a group. 
So I want to just kind of run through this and talk about this. I'm not going to have you figure out all these different samples, but I want you to see the idea. So let's suppose an eight-point quiz was given to four students, and the results were two, four, six, and eight. Four kids took it. If I made myself a little histogram, right, two, four, six, and eight, I'd have myself a flat um, histogram. But if I find all possible samples of size 2 with replacement, so I could have a 2 and a 4, find the average. I could have a 2 and a 6, find the average. A 2 and an 8, a 4 and a 2, a 4 and a 6. You get the idea, right? I could have a whole bunch of sample means or samples of 2, find the mean of each one of those, and then I would use this as my new x to find my x bar. That would cause my means, if I translated this over, the frequency of all my different means, like this would be 3, this would be 8, nope, divide by 2. That would be 4, that would be 5, this would be another 3, 5, 6. I'm finding the means of all those. If I took the frequency of each mean, I would have myself a histogram that looks more like a normal distribution or a bell curve. So we would find the means of the sample means, we would calculate the standard deviation, we would find that our standard deviation of our sample means was smaller than our population, which was just 2, 4, 6, and 8. And if we drew the histograms, we would see a difference. So here's what the central limit theorem says. As the sample size increases, n increases without limit, the shape of the distribution of our sample means, taken with replacement with a population of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, we will end up with the mu of x bar is equal to mu. Oh, I forgot this part. This is the important part. It'll approach a normal distribution. I was wondering where that went. Remember, normal distribution is a bell curve or a symmetric curve. So central limit theorem says as we take sample means and find the um, mean of the sample means, we are going to have a normal distribution. Second thing there, that green bullet, the mean of the sample means is going to end up being the same as the population mean. So that says mu of x bar is equal to mu. And last but not least, our standard deviation of our sample means is also called the standard error of the mean. I'll write this bigger so you can see it. So sigma of x bar is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. So the standard deviation is also the standard error because remember we have some room for error. Important formula, make sure you got that. And hopefully, can you see this one? Mu of x bar, everybody knows how to make a mu, right? Is equal to mu. All right. So we use mu of x bar because we're taking all the possible sample means. So we've included the whole population. So for samples with a sufficient size, the central limit theorem can be used to answer questions about sample means the same way that we answered questions about individual values. These are going to look a lot, now that we've gotten into the heart of this, they're going to look a lot like section 6.2 where we are looking for z-scores. Notice I've got a z. There is a difference in the formula. Notice that this is a normal distribution, and this is answering questions about different values. So our z-score formula is, if we're talking about the central limit theorem, z is equal to x bar minus mu all over sigma divided by the square root of n. Remember, x bar is a sample mean, right? That is not like your piece of data, but it's asking about a sample minus the mu, population mean, divided by the population standard deviation over the square root of n. Sometimes the trickiest part of this is getting it into your calculator. 
So when your original variable is normally distribu distributed before you do any sample means or anything else, the distribution of the sample means will still be normal. When the distribution of your original variable is not normal, you need 30 or more for your sample size so that we can use the distribution of the sample means. So look for n is greater than or equal to 30. We will be using sample means. Thirty is our typical sample size that we want to get. So now that we've gone through all of this central limit theorem stuff, and maybe your brain is spinning a teeny bit, let's do an example problem so you can see what it looks like. I've got my calculator. I've got my Z table, table E in appendix A. We can do this. There is one distinction I want to make sure I use. We've got two Z-score formulas, right? If we are looking at an individual, I can't remember if I have this up here. I don't. Well, I got that. If we are looking at an individual, you're going to actually read it. We use our standard Z-score formula that we all know and love. So if it's an individual, we know that Z is equal to X minus mu all over sigma. If we are looking at a sample, a little bullet there. If we are looking at a sample, remember that's what we're talking about with sample means and everything else. That's when we are going to use that other z score, which is z is equal to our x bar minus mu, because we'll be given a sample mean for our x bar. That's all over the very messy sigma over the square root of n. So you have to know your sample size. So when you are solving central limit theorem problems, we're going to do this the same way as we did our other problems. So let's talk about working weekends. The average time spent by construction workers who work on the weekends is 7.93 hours over a period of the two days, Saturday and Sunday. Assume the distribution is normally, approximately normal and has a standard deviation of 0 0.8 hours. Find the probability that an individual who works at that trade works fewer than eight hours on the weekend. All right, so this is bringing me back to 6.2a. So let's start with this. What's my mu? 7.93, right, over the weekend. My sigma, assume the standard deviation, is 0 0.8 hours. So we have that information. If you don't know me yet, I'm a picture drawer. So find the probability that an individual who works at that trade works fewer than eight hours. All right, so here's my standard deviation, or here's my normal curve. Here's my mu in the middle, right? And we said mu was 7.93. Fewer than eight hours then, obviously, would have to be here to the positive side. So this is eight hours. Fewer than, I shaded to the left. If I were asked about greater than, you know I'd shade to the right. So notice something important. An individual. That tells me I'm going to go back up to the top of this page. I'm going to use that z-score formula for the individual that does not have over the square root of n. So I'm going to say, all right, well, if this is my data, z is equal to 8 minus my mu over sigma. Standard deviation is 0 0.8. Then divide that out. I believe that my z score is about a, it's small, right? z is equal to, what is that, a 0 0.09? So I know that this is a z-score of 0 0.9, 0 0.09. So that means, don't forget, I'm going to go to my table, and I'm going to figure out then the probability. So the probability always comes from the z-table.
right? We look up the area under the curve. So if I look up a 0 0.09, 0 0.09 0, 0.0 and then across to 9. It looks like a 5359 to me. Tell me if I'm right here. So I'll be technical about this. The probability that x is less than or equal to, I'm going to put in um, the 8 hours. Or if you prefer, probability that x is less than or equal to a 0 0.09 for my z is equal to 0.5239. No, Look at this table one more time. 5359. Five, nine. Or 53.59% probability that a worker works more than eight hours on a weekend. No, I'm sorry, fewer than eight hours on a weekend. It's to the left. If I had asked that same question and said, What's the probability that they work more than eight hours? Then we would remember subtract from one because we'd have to find the side shaded to the right. Our probability Z table always gives us shading to the left. So that was an individual. Letter B, it asks for if a sample of 40 construction workers is randomly selected, find the probability that the mean of the sample is less than eight hours. So same graph, right? Here's 7.93 for my mean. Here is eight hours that I'm wondering about. It says fewer than or less than, so it's shaded to the left. But here's my important part. Here's the difference why we're not doing the same problem. It's a sample of 40 construction workers. So my z-score is not going to be 0 0.09 because now I'm looking at a sample. I am not looking at an individual. So please notice that distinction. So we're going to have a start of the same setup. We're going to use the formula that includes the one that we do for a sample. X bar minus mu all over sigma over the square root of n. So it's still an 8 minus 7.93 over standard deviation over the square root of 40, right? Sample of 40 construction workers. I would recommend, depending on how you're using your calculator, if you have a fraction button, you'll put that all in the denominator. Otherwise, use this. This is a division bar. So make sure you divide there one way or the other. When I did this calculation, I ended up with a 0 0.55. C equals 0 0.55. Very different. Please notice that's why you need to make sure that you see that. Find the probability, which means I have to go to my Z table, look up 0 0.5, go across, or 0 0.5, yeah, and then go across to 05. It looks like a 7088. So I could say the probability that X bar. I put less than up here, didn't I? Those guys should be greater than. No, they're less than. Probability that x bar is less than or equal to 8. Or I could say the probability that z, I should say z here, z is less than or equal to 0 0.55 is going to be 0, 0 0.7088. or 70.88% probability that a sample of 40 people will be less, work less than eight hours. So higher probability, right? Because we're dealing with a sample. We've got a lot of people who are gonna do different things. Look for those, that's a big distinction when you do these problems. Let's not go through this, but if we're talking about the average length of time a computer is used is 96 months, standard deviation of 16 months, if a random sample of 36 computers are selected, find the probability that the mean is between 90 and 100. We know automatically that when we draw that picture, it's going to be a between, right? Here's my mean at 96. Here's my between 90 and 100. The most important part that I want to ask is which formula are you going to use? Are you going to use the individual or the sample? 
if a random sample of 36 computers, so this is the sample, and n equals 36. So look for those terms. You're going to use the z formula that has the um, square root of n in it. That is the end of 6.3. Don't get too mind boggled. Think of it as the average of the averages is really what we're finding. And um, we'll do some practicing with this. Thanks for sticking around.